archaeologist of the National Monument Service of Ireland. Um, you're all very welcome here to Belfast and to this wonderful venue and to the 29th annual meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists. Um, as I said, I'm Chief Archaeologist of the National Monument Service of Ireland. Over the next few days, to those visitors here, you'll hear a lot of geographical terms. Um, you'll hear Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, Northern Ireland, the North of Ireland, the Ireland of Ireland, the South, the North, this place and that place. Um, I don't worry about it, you won't get the handle of that um, by Sunday. But whatever one chooses to call this place, there is huge excitement among the archaeological sector across this island that the conference is taking place in Belfast. It is a credit to Queen's University Belfast and to all the organisers. A really brave show of hands back in 2018 to host here, given what it takes to host EAA, and one which our National Monument Service has been very pleased to be able to support. As an added note, as Secretary to the Board of the European Archaeological Council, the sister organisation of the EAA, on behalf of our President Ander Grav and all the Board, our congratulations to you all here for the immense work in hosting this week's conference. Um, I will be your compare here for this evening. Um, air traffic chaos in the UK has obviously disrupted the plans of many, so give yourselves a good clap on the back for even getting here this evening. Um, during this evening's ceremony, we'll be entertained by some of the best talent from here in Belfast and beyond. Um, we'll have an ancient Irish horn performance from the world-renowned Armagh Rhymers and archaeologist James McKee as we move from this wonderful room into the auditorium towards the end of this evening's ceremony. The name of Belfast in the Irish language, Belfaster, means the mouth of the ford, reflecting the importance of the river to the city and its origins on the banks of the River Lagan. And so to begin this evening's entertainment, we welcome local singer Rose McCullough singing My Lagan Love. It is a haunting song with reference to the River Lagan, which runs next to us here. Rose will be singing and playing the traditional Irish harp. So please put your hands together for Rose. Thank you, Rose, uh, for a beautiful performance. Um, we now have a few welcoming addresses to you all, starting with Eileen Murphy, um, Chair of the Local Organising Committee. I'd like to welcome to the stage to say a few words. Thank you very much, Michael. So, on behalf of the Local Organising Committee of the 29th Annual Meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists, I'm delighted to welcome you to the wonderful city of Belfast. So this event is organised by the Department of Archaeology and Paleocology at Queen's University Belfast and our conference has been generously supported by Visit Belfast and Tourism NI in, range, in addition to a range of partners from across the island and much further beyond as well. So Belfast had its origins as a small medieval settlement at a crossing point over the River Lagan. By the late 19th century, it had developed into a major industrial port on the Irish Sea, and it specialised in shipbuilding and uh, the linen industry. So the old linen factories of Linenopolis have long since gone, but our motto, Weaving Narratives, was chosen to reflect the impact that the industry had on our city. And the motto also reflects the strong tradition of creative writing, so from the 18th, 19th century weaver poets through to household names like C.S. Lewis and Seamus Heaney. And the ultimate outcome of our painstaking work as archaeologists is telling the stories of those who came before us. So we are all the weavers of narratives of the past. Our conference logo depicts the enigmatic Bow Island figure from County Fermanagh. And it's thought to date to the early medieval period. So we can't be entirely sure of its meaning, but it's been suggested that it's a representation of the Irish war goddess Bive, which also means the hooded crow. And we selected it for our logo because it has two faces. So one's looking forward and one's looking backwards. And we thought this was symbolic of what we do as archaeologists, because we look to the past to help us inform the present and the future. So Belfast has been the capital of Northern Ireland since its establishment in 1921. And, you know, it's well known we have not been without our difficulties, um, especially during the 30-year period from 1968 when the Troubles raged. 
And the signing of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in 1998, it really did herald um, a new era for our people. So given this, we are truly delighted to have the EAA visit Belfast on the 25th anniversary of the signing of the agreement. And hopefully our peace process can continue to, to provide hope in a world that sometimes feels very dark, especially at present. So the main venue of the annual meeting is Queen's University Belfast. Uh, Queen's was founded in 1845, and it's the ninth oldest university in the UK. The historic Lanyon Building, where hopefully you've all, all been already today, it's uh, one of the great architectural set pieces of Belfast. So we very much hope you enjoy exploring our campus and um, the leafy suburbs in which it sits. So Belfast people were quite renowned, you know, for being fairly warm, having easy ways and quite a plain speaking sense of humour. So I hope you're not too sensitive when you're out and about. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy learning some Norn Iron, as we like to say, flying. Um, so yeah, just ask us to speak a bit slowly if you don't understand what we're saying. It is English. Okay. And of course, our pubs are legendary. And again, I hope you all get to savour some of those. So just before I finish, just want to say a few words of thanks. Um, we're extremely grateful to Sylvia, Sylvie, Katka, Christina, Magda and Sarah of the EAA Secretariat for the unwavering support and guidance they provided us with throughout the organisation process. And a really huge thanks are also due to Emma and Orla from Conference Partners International because they provided just incredible um, conference management support. We also need to thank um, the members of the scientific committee. You know, with the scale of the conference, they really did have a, a big job this year, reading all those session proposals and abstracts. So thank you very much to all of them. I um, also want to thank the National Advisory Board, the EAA Executive Board, of course, our fantastic volunteers who really help us keep the show on the road. And you can see them all sporting their lovely green T-shirts. Um, our excursion guides, hopefully anyone who's been on one of our tours has, en has enjoyed it, especially because the weather has stayed nice and dry. Um, and also then members of the Queen's University support staff. So all of these people have made a really significant contribution towards making this conference a reality. So I, re I can't believe we're actually here and I, I hope you will all have an absolutely fantastic conference. And all I can say is welcome to Belfast. Thank you, Eileen. As I said, when you put your and step forward to host this a few years ago. It was a testament to you, um, to Queen's University Belfast and your and your department, um, showing the, the the strength of your ambition and competence. And and um, always a pleasure to work with you on the various projects we have done. But on next, I'd like to officially welcome our Queen's University Belfast representative um, is Margaret Topping, Pro Vice Chancellor for Internationalisation at Queen's University Belfast, to say a few words, Margaret. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the welcome and the introduction. I am absolutely delighted to welcome you here to Belfast on behalf of Queen's University Belfast. As Pro Vice Chancellor for Internationalisation and Global Engagement, it's such a pleasure to have colleagues from all over the world come to Queen's for a few days of intellectual stimulation, new ideas, dialogue that tests our disciplines, and also just for the sort of conviviality and reconnection with colleagues that we sometimes only really get at our subject association conferences. So I'd really like to thank the European Association of Archaeologists for selecting Belfast and Queen's to host the conference and also visit Belfast and Tourism Northern Ireland as our main sponsor. As Eileen mentioned, a number of other organisations have provided sponsorship and support and we'd like to extend our thanks to them also. Queen's has been an anchor institution in Northern Ireland for over 175 years. And this year has been an exceptional year for the university, not least in terms of conferences. In April, as, as Eileen alluded to, we hosted a major global conference to mark the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which brought peace to Northern Ireland. That was attended by Queen's Chancellor, Secretary Hillary, Hillary Clinton, the key architects of the agreement, including Senator George Mitchell, President Bill Clinton, Tony Blair, Bertie Ahern, and global leaders past and present, including UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, Irish Taoiseach Leo Varadkar, and the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. This was a hugely momentous event for a university which is committed 
to its responsibility to our local community, as well as to having the kind of global reach that is exemplified by our hosting wonderful events like the one we're welcoming you to today. At Queen's, we are proud of our impact on Northern Ireland, both economically and socially. An independent report published in the London Economics by London Economics puts the university's economic impact on Northern Ireland at £3 billion. That comes from research and knowledge exchange, from our teaching and learning activities, from our commercialisation activity. But our societal impact is also key to our responsibilities. And our new strategy for 2030 commits us to ensuring that we are making the sorts of civic and social responsibility that can really make a difference in our region. We have committed recently to embedding the UN Sustainable Development Goals in every aspect of our work. We're working closely with communities across the city to help address long-standing issues regarding deprivation and educational underachievement. I'm very proud to say that 30% of our students come from non-traditional widening participation backgrounds. We have programmes that provide the opportunity for young people who have the talent to succeed at Queen's, but may not have the opportunity to do so. And I'd just like to say that colleagues in archaeology have been absolutely key to this work of reaching out to the community beyond the university, really bringing to life the value and the excitement of the research that we contribute here. Archaeology is locally committed but globally recognised. It's a world-class department for teaching, research and impact. Recently recognised in the top 100 uh, archaeology departments in the QS World University Ranking. It was 12th in the United Kingdom in our most recent National Research Excellence uh, Framework. 15th in the UK Times Good University Guide. And that's down to the passion and the commitment of colleagues such as Eileen Murphy, who has taken on this monumentous task uh, of, of organising this event alongside being Deputy Head of School and much more besides. So I've thanked the EAA, I've thanked Visit Belfast and Tourism NI, but I'd like to recognise Eileen and the, the gargantuan efforts that she has put in place over the last couple of years, actually longer than I realised, since 2018. I know she's delighted that the conference is finally here. Um, Eileen, congratulations to you for all of your work. I hope you actually get to sit down and enjoy the next couple of days. But can we just take a moment to recognise um, Eileen and the team that has supported her from the school? From my point of view, whatever achievements any given university can boast, none of it's done in isolation. It's through partnership and collaboration locally, nationally and internationally. And that's why, from the point of view of the work that I lead on in the university, it's such a pleasure and a real privilege to welcome colleagues from all over the world to Queen's. So I hope for those of you who are visiting us for the first time that this will not be the last. I look forward to welcoming you back to Belfast at some future date, maybe just to visit, maybe to present your work, hopefully to develop the partnerships, the seeds of which I hope will be planted over the next couple of days, Maybe even some of you will come to join our scholarly community as members of staff. But in the meantime, enjoy these few days. Subject association conferences, I think, are very special events because they do provide us with those wonderful, increasingly rare opportunities to step away from the admin, step away from all the challenges and remind ourselves how much we love what we do and why we do it. So enjoy weaving new narratives as a subject association. And above all, make sure you find some time to enjoy what we in Ireland call the crack. That's one of those, well, it's not just a Northern Irelandism, it's, it's across the island. And if you don't know what that is yet, you're guaranteed to know what it is by the end of the night. Enjoy. I wish you a fruitful few days and hopefully see some of you in the campus on the next couple of days, but also in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, as Margaret and Eileen have alluded to, it's very much a partnership here in Northern Ireland and in Belfast in particular in bringing you all here and bringing this together. Um, it's a wonderfully vibrant city, as both Margaret and Eileen have referred to, which you'll experience over the coming days. And uh, that doesn't happen by accident. It happens with huge input, um, including from organizations such as Visit Belfast, which has been crucial to hosting um, EAA here in Belfast this week. And uh, I'd like to welcome Deborah Collins, head of business events at Visit Belfast, who accompanied Eileen to Barcelona. Uh, when the 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 offer of hosting in Belfast was planned. Um, I think we're all reminded how many years ago, as Margaret said, that was. But uh, we welcome 
Deborah, please to a stage. Mrs. President, ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests, on behalf of Visit Belfast, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to Belfast and to the ICC on the occasion of the opening of the 29th EAA Annual Meeting. May I first take this opportunity to thank and remember some of the wonderful EAA community who I met back in Barcelona in 2018 and then again in Belfast in 2019 when they first came to visit. Felipe, Mags, Sylvie and of course Karen Waugh, who I want to make special mention of as someone whose energy, kindness and spirit shone bright. I hope she would be proud of the meeting and programme that has been woven here together in Belfast. I also want to say a huge personal thank you to Eileen Murphy and her brilliant team, who not only made me feel incredibly welcomed to the archaeology community, but for their unwavering commitment to making this event happen in Belfast. As it has been alluded to already, this year marks the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and 24 years since Visit Belfast was set up, with foresight from Belfast City Council and Tourism Northern Ireland. Since then, tourism has become one of the city's success stories and a key driver in Belfast Renaissance, creating and supporting jobs and driving economic growth and urban regeneration across the city region. Investment has enabled Belfast to flourish and now, more than ever, we are working on tourism as a force for good that gives back to our communities. We are bringing the world to Belfast and ensuring our events have inclusivity, sustainability, legacy and impact at their heart. We thank EAA and the Local Organising Committee for their commitment to these objectives, and I hope all of this will be evident from the programme. I want to make special mention of our pioneering food poverty programme called Changing the Menu for Good, which EAA have kindly partnered on with us in order to help those in Belfast who are experiencing food insecurity. You will have the chance to donate via QR codes at key points around the Queen's University campus. And so far, through events coming to Belfast, this project has raised over £20,000 for our local food bank called the People's Kitchen. And we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making a difference to our local communities. For those of you who are visiting Belfast for the first time, I hope that you will get the chance to explore our great wee city and perhaps partake in a pint of the black stuff in one of our many historic pubs and bars. Be sure to soak up the atmosphere in the lively cathedral quarter where you will be assured of the crack, as we say in Northern Ireland. I also hope you will have time to experience the beauty of our rugged landscapes on one of the planned excursions. The only thing we can't promise is the weather, but I think it's to be nice. I know you have a busy programme ahead, so I would just like to finish up by wishing you every success in your meeting. I have no doubt the learnings, friendships and knowledge exchange will motivate and inspire far beyond these few days in Belfast. And we hope to see you all back with friends and family very soon. On behalf of Visit Belfast, Belfast City Council, Tourism Northern, Northern Ireland and all of our industry partners, thank you for choosing Belfast and have a wonderful conference. Thank you very much, Deborah. Um, before we have a little bit of a musical and dance entertainment, um, importantly want to welcome the president of the EAA, Esther Banfi, to say a few words to you um, and include a few moments of reflection for some, for some colleagues who are no longer with us. Esther. Welcome EAA in the Northwest Atlantic Gateway of Europe. For the second time after the COVID pandemics, we have come together here more in number than ever before. We have more than 3,000 participants for the first time in EAA's history. We have come together to celebrate archaeology, to celebrate that we are stronger than the external obstacles, be them of any kind of nature. We have come together to celebrate ideas, common brainstorming, old and new friendship, and collegial cooperation. 
first words of gratitude go to our host in Belfast, who get, who have been committed to hard work for years to make this meeting possible. They, together with the wonderful and professional EAA staff, have overcome the bumps of organizing a fully hybrid meeting again, something the EAA has become a real pioneer among similar associations. The composition of the social events and the content of themes and sessions is an outcome of the joint intensive work of the Belfast Scientific Committee, the Executive Board and our EAA staff. And of course, a special thanks goes to uh, my predecessor, Felipe, together with uh, the board members, the officers from that time, including the late Karen Wo, just mentioned, who first embraced the idea of bringing the EAA annual meeting to Belfast and started the organizational work uh, back in 18 and 19. The program is rich as ever. You will have seen the program book by now, and some of you might be a little bit desperate about the number of clashing sessions you are not able to attend. As we are all aware, it is not a real possibility to extend the length of the annual meeting. Logistics, and especially financing conditions, hardly allow us a longer stay. I wish you fulfill your curiosity and make the most out of these coming three days and use the coffee breaks, the black beer and Guinness times for exchanging results, forging new plans among yourselves. Some of the six main themes are about sustainability in a more and more unsustainable world. Others offer coping practices for both the plethora of new data as well as the urging necessity to preserve these data for the future. The data are not just always uh, about results of new research or heritage activity, but are also an important tool for the strategy to monitor and preserve archaeological heritage that is becoming more and more endangered, either by the climate change or by war conflicts. About the current situation of the latter, we keep the possibilities for our Ukrainian members to attend without membership and registration fee. And there is a new initiative uh, planned to being launched this year to help Ukrainian archaeologists within the family circle of information flow. We ask authors and publishers to send copies to Ukrainian institutional libraries. Details are work in progress, but meanwhile, we do encourage our members who, food, who feel that they are up to making personal contacts with Ukrainian individual members and vice versa in order to exchange information, data, news, PDFs, and more upon personal interests and agreements. The goal is to keep each other in the loop for their mutual benefit, while certainly help Ukrainian members to hold a secure place in EAA's family. After the Budapest annual meeting, I close my words expressing my wish that the next meeting would take place while there is peace in Europe again. This is not the case. But for all that, the power of culture, the power of thinking and discussing together will hopefully point at future times when the archaeology will bind us together without frontiers in Europe, for Europe and beyond Europe. To experience the validity of this thought, one cannot find a venue better and nicer than Belfast with its long past, historically multiple bonds, and meanwhile, a vibrant and overwhelming openness and joy in sharing, hosting, cooperating for the joy of us all. Thank you for your attention. Now, I would like to ask you to raise for a moment of silence, remembering our fellow colleagues, EAA members who passed away the last year.
speaking. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Esther, reminding this, that, that, that with all your words that, that archaeology is, is without border and how wonderful it is to be able to gather and, and, and nurture the friendships of old. And, and it's wonderful to see so many colleagues of old. I don't say old colleagues anymore, but colleagues of old um, here this evening. It's, it's a lot of fun, but also very stimulating and sharing our experiences in terms, also in terms of management of archaeology. I'm always reminded through our EAC uh, gatherings that um, one always comes away feeling one is not alone, um, everyone faces the same issues but how wonderful to be able to gather here thank you esther we're going to have a few moments of of wonderful belfast entertainment um we come to a few more presentations and bear with us now because the flight chaos has caused a few things and a few people to be stuck in places that they're not supposed to be so we're um we're winging this right now and so but that's okay. Um, it shows that it's not over rehearsed. Um, and so, but we're going to move to presenting the EAA's prestigious prizes for 2023. And first up, if you arrive from an airport, is yes, I see a hand up. We welcome Jaime straight out of a taxi. Um, Jaime Almanza, chair of the EAA Heritage Prize Committee, who will be presenting a number of European archaeological heritage prizes and first prize to the taxi drivers of Northern Ireland. Indeed, so in extremis, I, I thought I was not going to make it. I was supposed to be here last Monday, you know, but with the flight disruptions that probably most of you suffer these days. Well, I just made it here like 20 minutes ago, you know, right enough to grab Sanera and prepare what I'm going to say. <laughs> so, Well, first of all, uh, I guess you all know what the European Archaeological Heritage Prize is, you know, as members, because you receive the information every year, and actually we keep getting a lot of nominations. So I just want to encourage you to think about it also next year, uh, who should deserve, deserve on your opinion, either as an individual or as an institution, project, etc., uh, a prize for next year. Anyway, uh, first thing uh, I would like to do is uh, thank uh, the whole EIA committee for the support you know, to this prize since already like uh, over 20 years. You know? uh, we are trying to, to make it uh, bigger, better. It takes a lot of effort and hopefully you know, in the next few years we will be able you know, to, to offer uh, an even more prestigious prize because you know, it's already a very good one. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the committee you know, that uh, I have the, the pleasure to, to chair for the first year. Uh, well, I'm Jaime Almansa, and with me we have uh, Paulina Florianovic, uh, George Hagren, Jan Marik, and uh, Nursan Yalman. So uh, thank you very much uh, to them for their uh, big work uh, during these months, you know, both uh, to gather nominations and also to evaluate and uh, give them. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, all the nominees and the people who nominated them, because you know, uh, it's quite uh, a challenge you know, to, to go ahead and say, yeah, I think this person deserves it, so let's go for it, and also to accept you know, uh, uh, running for, for the prize. But uh, with no further delay, uh, I would like to start uh, with the prizes, because it's what we are waiting for here. And uh, the first one will be the first uh, uh, individual uh, European Archaeological Heritage Prize. Since the Russian aggression to Ukraine in February 2022, protecting archaeological heritage has been a challenge in the context of a major humanitarian crisis within Europe. The conflict is still open, and we take a moment to remind the statement adopted by several archaeological societies this April, including ours, in support of our Ukrainian colleagues. The efforts joined during the first weeks to protect and evacuate artifacts allowed the safeguard of dozens of thousands of archaeological materials in danger only in the National Museum of the History of Ukraine, almost 120,000. Its team not only rushed to protect archaeological heritage in the first moments of the attack, helping other regional museums to do so, 
But as soon as it was safer, it has continued to conduct research to open new exhibitions and to organize outreach activities while monitoring looting cases. For his leadership in the protection of Ukrainian archaeological heritage during the war, for his commitment to raise awareness about the importance of archaeological heritage in these difficult moments, and for his overall professional and scientific profile, Professor Fedir Andrashuk is awarded the 2023 Individual Archaeological Heritage Prize of the European Association of Archaeologists. Fedir, I have been instructed uh, to speak, uh, to make a very brief speech, so I, I, I feel I need it. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much for, for this prestigious Heritage Prize. It is an honor to be recognized for the work that has been done by our museum. And I am humbled to have been a part of such a dedicated team. I would like to express my deepest thanks to my colleagues at the museum. The commitment and tireless efforts have played a pivotal role in ensuring the safety and preservation of our invaluable collection. I would also like to extend my gratitude to all those who have supported our museum in many different ways. Uh, your support has allowed us to protect the collection and develop new forms of work and activities at the museum during the war time. Without your support, none of this would be possible. Lastly, I would like to acknowledge the importance of collaboration in our field. It is through the collective efforts of museum researchers and cultural institutions worldwide that we can ensure the longevity of our shared heritage. In conclusion, I'm truly honored to receive this heritage prize, but I must emphasize that this achievement is not mine alone. It is a testament of the dedication and hard work of my colleagues at the museum, as well as the support of different people and institutions. Thank you all once again for this incredible honor. Now uh, we're going to move on for the Institutional Award. During the excavation in Irulegi archaeological site two summers ago, an interesting object was dug. Its study uncovered one of the most significant findings in Europe of the last years for its social and political impact. The Hand of Irulegi represented the oldest inscription in Proto-Basque language, and it was not in Latin characters. Since the announcement, in a matter of weeks, the Hand has become one of the most iconic elements for Basque culture, fostering all kinds of manifestations from music to urban art, as well as a deep academic and political interest that reached millions of people in the national and international media. All this is part of the great work of a society that becomes 75 years old now and has been working with great success for the research, protection, and dissemination of archaeological heritage. For its commitment to archaeological heritage and historical memory, for the deep social and political impact of its work, and especially for the outstanding discovery of the Hand of Irulegi, the Sociedad de Ciencias Aranzadi is awarded the 2023 Institutional Archaeological Heritage Prize of the European Association of Archaeologists. Good evening. On behalf of Aranzadi Science Society, I would like to start by thanking the European Association of Archaeologists for this recognition. And of course, Dr. Josu Narvarte, of the University of the Basque Country, Euskal Herriko Universitatea, for the nomination. We are beyond grateful for this recognition. Arantzadi Science Society has been working on the research, management, and dissemination of natural and cultural heritage since 1947, and it is a renowned institution in the Basque Country. We work on a community-led archaeology model where volunteers, local communities, and archaeology professionals partake on the archaeological interventions organized by the society every summer. In fact, some of my very talented and skilled colleagues are here today, and they will actively participate with several oral presentations during the annual meeting. So I hope you, you'll have the chance to meet and network with all of them. In these past 76 years, we have discovered many caves with marvelous prehistoric paintings, megalithic burials, Roman cities, medieval castles, shipwrecks, ancient ironworks, and since 2000, 
we have applied archaeological methodology to dig mass graves and retrieve remains of thousands of disappeared people in the context of the Spanish Civil War or the conflict in Western Sahara. Working with heritage is quite conflictive, but it is our responsibility as heritage professionals to contribute to a broader discourse in the current global climate of fear, war, and polarization. Scientific research of our past is a tool that enables us to think critically, and our work may serve also as a way to advocate for the defense of human rights. On a regional level, Aranzadi represents all of these values and has always defended the idea that we need memory to know our past and science to know our future. And at the core of Aranzadi Science Society is the sense of community and, and belonging. On a daily basis, our work wouldn't be possible without volunteers. With the effort and looking for synergies from the bottom up, we hope to keep working with the same passion at least 75 more years. This EAA Heritage Prize will sure fuel our passion because without emotion, there is no archaeology. And now uh, our Director General, Juancho Aguirre Mauleón, would like to thank you briefly in Euskera, the Basque language, uh, our mother tongue, but also the language that we use on a daily basis to work and to do archaeology. So, Juancho, zurea deita. Europako sari arkeologiko honek, Aranzadi Zientzia Elkarterantzat, ore handia da, indar berri akartzen ditugu, gure Euskal Herriko iragana metodologia zientifikorekin ikertzen jarraitu alizateko, belaunaldi berria formatzen ari gera, eta gurekin izan dago guztioi, mila eskera unitz, eta baita ere antolatzailei, mila eskera. Eskerrik asko, Juancho Metel, for those of you who don't know Euskera, that probably is most, because I don't know it either, the only word that you should learn now is Eskerrik asko, thank you. Now, well, as I said before, uh, this year we had many, many uh, nominations and it was very difficult uh, to choose the, the winners, no? So we decided uh, to give two honorary mentions, one for the individual prize and another one for the institutional one. So uh, we will move, move forward now for the first honorary mention in the individual uh, archaeological uh, European Archaeological Heritage Prize. And uh, well, it goes as follows. Some achievements can only be valued in the perspective of a long career. Over three decades of daily work in the configuration of a modern discipline from the periphery, helping to develop the current models of archaeological heritage management in his region, pushing for an open science that makes archaeological heritage available to people, and devoting a life to the Iberian culture from research and management. For his trajectory and his impact in Andalusian, Spanish, and European archaeology, we want to award a special mention to Professor Arturo Ruiz Rodriguez. I think uh, Isabel Moreno is going to, to collect it. So, thank you. Good evening, uh, everybody. First of all, uh, I want to thank the EAA organization on behalf of Professor Arturo Ruiz for granting him with this important prize. For Professor Ruiz, this award means the, culmina the culmination of a long career dedicated to the research and promotion of the archaeological heritage, and more specifically, of the protohistoric societies of Iberia. I would, I would like to share with you some important aspects for the fewer of Arturo Ruiz. His titles desire to investigate prehistoric Iberian societies in the south of the Iberian Peninsula is for us, his colleagues who work side by side with him, an example of how it is necessary to build historical narratives uh, from the periphery to obtain a more complete and complex vision of the human past, to stay away from cliches, um, be him more open and inclusive. In this sense, Professor Reed gave the inaugural talk of the first EAA conference held in Santiago de Compostela in 1992. It was entitled A Europe of Diversity, a view from archaeology. For us, his students at the University of Jaén, the lifetime career of Arturo Ruiz is an inspiring example of how archaeological research must transcend the borders of the academy to reach the entire society. 
In addition, he is also a reference for a large number of archaeological professionals in Spain, since Arturo Ruiz played a great role in the professionalization of archaeology in our country. Finally, we must underline his tireless struggle for the socialization of heritage, which has resulted in the construction of a new world of uh, visitable archaeological sites, as well as a unique thematic museum of the Iberians in Jaén, which are today a hallmark of our territory. Thanks to Felipe Criado for the nomination uh, and the organization of the EAA for granting Professor Reed with this award. And thanks, Arturo, for your enthusiasm and effort in internationalizing the Iberians. Thank you very much. Well, and last but not least, uh, we have the honorary mention for the institutional prize that goes as follows. Along the last few years, a group of researchers, museum workers, as well as other community and political stakeholders from a dozen countries, drove an initiative to showcase the largest international exhibition about the recent prehistory of Southeast Europe. On tour in the USA from 2022 to 2025, it is already receiving thousands of visits. For the efforts in the organization of such a great venture, for the impact and relevance it is having, and for the precedent in cooperation between different countries overcoming conflict with archaeological heritage, we want to award a special mention to the international organizing team on the first Kings of Europe exhibition. I think uh, Attila Gyuce is collecting the prize. Yeah. Well, uh... I'm standing here uh, representing over 200 people uh, from altogether 13 countries. So this project, the First Kings of Europe exhibition project, was specifically created to actually present the magnificent archaeological heritage of the Balkans and the surrounding countries. For this recognition in the name of this uh, organizing team, really, we are talking about hundreds of people. I would like to thank uh, the EA for the recognition. Uh, what you need to understand that it was not an easy ride. We are talking about seven years of very close collaboration and cooperation among these people, side by side, uh, trying to overcome conflicts, trying to overcome frictions that characterizes this region for hundreds of years. Uh, I would like to, in the name of the organizing team, thank uh, some institutions, including the Field Museum, who was the official developer of this exhibition and committed to this seemingly insane project for years in bad days and good days, including the COVID, for example. Also, I would like to express my gratitude to the National Endowment of uh, Humanities, the America for Bulgaria Foundation, and the Constant Institution uh, of Archaeology for their support of this project. For us, and uh, let me be a little bit more personal, uh, for me and also the co-curator of the exhibition who cannot be here, Bill Parkinson, this project represents a little bit more than the exhibition itself, which is very important. And the books are also very important that came out. It really just represents unity, cooperation. And we really hope, and we see the first signs, that this project is a catalyzator of further similar and non-similar non-archaeological projects that would promote the archaeological heritage and would eventually lead to a better more peaceful world in the Balkans and elsewhere. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much, Abdullah. And just uh, thank you, everybody, for your interest always in this prize and start thinking about the nominations for next year. Have a nice conference. Thank you, Hemi. Um, we're going to move on straight. I will say this to all the award winners. I've just agreed with Hemi. Um, at the end of this, if you'd like, if you'd like a photo taken, 
if you'd like to come up to the stage, we'll get a, a group photo taken of all the Shiz winners. But we're going to move next. I'm going to invite Ellen Dallin, Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Oscar Montelius Foundation, to present the award of the Oscar Montelius Foundation's Early Career Achievement Prize. Ellen. Dear hosts, dear EIA members and conference participants, on behalf of the Oscar Montelius Foundation, it is my great pleasure to award the OMF Early Career Achievement Prize 2023 to, to PhD candidate Abel Ruiz at University Pompeo in Spain. Before doing so, I would like to remind about the idea of this prize, which is to encourage formally recognized and valued work undertaken by young archaeologists wherever they work, be it in academia, museum, heritage management or commercial archaeology. We urge all our young and early career members to continue to keep up the quality and excellence of work you all do, and we look forward to continuing high standard of applications in the years to come. The trustees of the Oscar Montelius Foundation were really impressed with the standard of all applications received for the Early Career Achievement Prize in 2023. Many of the applications were of very high quality, but there were three applicants in addition to the prize winner who were exceptional and deserve an honorary mention. In alphabetic order, these were Maria Pareo Cummings for her work on cross-disciplinary work on monkey imagery to redefine a Gian Bronze Age. Juri van den Hurk for his work on the history of the Atlantic Grey Whale, his use of uh, research to establish the factors required for return of the Grey Whale to European waters and Simon Radchenko for his significant and valuable work on saving cultural heritage in Ukraine. I will now read the justification for the prize. Albert Ruiz awarded the 2023 prize of the grounds of the social innovation, interdisciplinary and international impact of his early career work. Abel Ruiz is a young researcher using a combination of archaeology and ethnoarchaeology, applying his knowledge to inform responses to climate change. His doctoral thesis is entitled Resilience and Adaptation to Drylands in Northeastern Ethiopia. Most of his work is already published and providing new and valuable insights into the past, identifying practical implications for sustainable agriculture and pointing out direction for further archaeological exploration. This makes him an exceptional candidate for the Oscar Montelius Prize. Abel Ruiz, in his uh, scientific work, together with colleagues, they have investigated the interaction between environment and traditional agro-systems and new ethnographic data. Finger millet, pearl millet and shogum are amongst the most important draft-tolerant crops worldwide. They constitute primary staple crops in drylands, where their production is known to date back more than 5,000 years. The models used in Ruiz's work shows that the duration of the plant's growing cycle as soil water holding capacity and soil nutrient availability are determined in the cultivation. As for traditional cultivation practices of millet and shorghum, need to be reconsidered in response to the increase in erity levels worldwide. Local traditional cultivation methods and knowledge therefore play a vital role to meet climate change and provide potential to contribute to resilience and sustainability in dryland agriculture. Abel Ruiz's work contributes to find solutions to one of the biggest challenges in our time with climate change. This summer, we witnessed extremely hot temperature worldwide, which affects the viability of modern food production. In this light, Abel Ruiz's work is of outstanding importance, demonstrating that the use of traditional crops and cultivation methods can meet climate change. In view of his work, Abel Ruiz 
can be truly considered an outstanding early career archaeologist, fulfilling all selection criteria. He is therefore awarded the 2023 Early Career Achievement Prize of the Oscar Montelius Foundation. Mr. Ruiz, please come to the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to thank to the organizers for putting this event together, to all the volunteers, uh, uh, performance, uh, performers, and um, uh, everyone working today. Uh, I am grateful to the Oscar Montelius Foundation and their current board of trustees for selecting me uh, for this early career achievement, and to my PhD supervisors, uh, Carla Lancelotti and Stefano Viaggetti, for nominating me. I think in a, that I was uh, deserving of, of, of this award. Uh, I am also uh, thankful for the companionship of past and present members of my research group, uh, Culture, Archaeology and Sociological Systems, led by Marco Madela in Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona. And I wish also to acknowledge the support of the Eastern Tigray Archaeological Project, led by Catherine D'Andrea of Simon Fraser University in British Columbia, Canada. Uh, climate change is one of the most pressing concerns of our generation. One might wonder what can we do about it as archaeologists. This question was already addressed during the EAA annual meeting just two years ago, when a diverse group of 40 archaeologists from all over the world constituted the Kyle Summit for a Social Archaeology of Climate Change. In an inspiring manifesto, they explain how archaeology can be a key tool for enhanced socio-ecological resilience and adaptive capacity of human societies through the study of past adaptive behavior. Throughout my uh, doctoral research, I have been working on past adaptation to arid environments in the northern Horn of Africa. Uh, indeed, drylands are expanding every year, and still we have very poor understanding of how to produce food there, both in the present but also in the past. Um, uh, in the framework of the Raindrops project, we have studied sustainable, resilient agricultural practices in drylands based on the cultivation of African C4 crops. I have particularly focused on the case of Tigray in northern Ethiopia, where we have highlighted the characteristics of an agroecological system that has been in place for over 3,000 years. These practices and techniques represent an outstanding body of uh, traditional ecological knowledge in order to face the challenges that are, are being raised by the ongoing artification of the planet. Uh, finally, I cannot leave without thanking the people of Tigray for their kindness, uh, patience and help during my field work there. It is thanks to their incredible support that I was able to carry out the research that led me to be awarded with this prize. I am grateful to my dear friend, uh, Professor Germane Meresa from Axum University, who took care of me during my last stay in Tigray in December 2019. Since then, I have not been able to be back due to COVID-19, but also to the awful civil war that affected the region between November 2020 and November 2022, and whose effects still continue to limit the access to the region. Uh, before finishing, I want to uh, thank the organizers of this event once again for giving me the opportunity to raise awareness about a neglected conflict whose consequences are affecting the lives of millions of people in Ethiopia. Thank you. Everyone. Congratulations, Abel, and, and, and um and uh, thank you, Ellen. I'm um, going to invite now next Kate Freeman, editor of the European Journal of Archaeology and chair of the 2023 EAA Student Award Selection Committee to present the 2023 EAA Student Award. If there's anything more wonderful than chairing a panel that gets to assess the brilliant work coming from archaeology students, I don't know what it is. This is the best part of my job as editor every year to read the amazing contributions being made by students just launching their careers and joining us at the EA. Um, the European Association of Archaeologists has instituted the EA Student Award in 2002, and the prize is awarded annually for the best paper presented by a student or archaeologist working on a dissertation at the EA annual meeting. The papers are evaluated on for their academic merit and innovative ideas by the Student Award Committee that I'm very lucky to chair. 
And we award a prize, but I want to thank uh, many of our partners who are publishers uh, and our friends in the Society of American Archaeology. As this is an award for a student, this is a prize that helps them build their knowledge and build their connections. So it's hundreds of euros worth of books, journal memberships, and an annual membership to the SA. And we thank our partners for contributing these prizes to help our student members grow their careers. And so now I will read the, the laudatio for this year's winner. This year, the European Association of Archaeologists awards the student award to Mathilde Vestergaard Meyer for her paper, Growing Up in Little Ice Age Greenland, the Contrasting Roles of Norse and Thule Children in Adapting to, climate ch uh, to Changing Climates. Uh, childhood is a life stage of great interest to many archaeologists, not the least because it is one we often find difficult to access and document. Children were and are significant members of their communities, and their play can help us understand social values, identities, and a wide range of practices, as well as the way childhood itself was understood in different times and places. In her paper, Growing Up in Little Ice Age Greenland, Matilda Vestergaard Meyer examines children's toys uh, from Greenland, deriving from Norse and Thule Inuit communities. She uses these to gain insight into the different childhoods experienced by juveniles in these two societies and how those differences may have impacted their cultural adaptations to climate change. Meyer situates her research within the broad field of niche construction theory, a strand of evolutionary theory that focuses on how organisms adopt and alter their environments. Building on this literature, she argues that toys and play activity are loci of identity creation, social learning, and cumulative knowledge production, thus making them especially valuable for understanding cognition, adult behavior, and social norms. To test these ideas, she collated a database of 64 Norse toys and 2,271 Inuit toys from published excavation reports and her own investigation of museum collections. These she categorized into five shared types, games, social, transport, tools, and weapons. She notes that at all periods, there were more and more variable toys in Inuit communities, and the number and variety of these increased during times of major social and environmental change. She concludes by contrasting the narrower toy kit of Norse settler children with the more diverse Inuit toys, and she argues that Norse children had less scope to explore and exploit the resources around them because their toys remained few in type and closely linked to older ways of life. This then may have affected their cognitive architecture, hindering their ability to adapt to a changing Greenland environment. We congratulate Matilda and look forward to the publication of her paper as she continues to develop her research. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say thank you very much. I'm really honored to getting this award and I'm really grateful. And it really uh, reaffirmed me in my belief that childhood archaeology is very important. So thank you. Congratulations, Matilda. Thank you, Kate. Um, the final prize says of the evening. I, I believe, is the EAA Book Prizes. Um, and I'm going to ask Robin Skeets, who's chair of the Book Prize Selection Committee, to the stage to present those awards. Robin. Thank you very much. And good evening on behalf of the EAA Book Prize Committee. The EAA Book Prize is intended to celebrate books recently published by EAA members. The range of books considered is broad, even vast as we experienced, including research monographs, public-facing books, and books addressing issues in archaeological heritage management. A committee of 11 EAA members uh, agreed first a shortlist of 10 books 
details of which were announced via the EAA's website, uh, and then to rank these books and agree a winner based ultimately on our perceived impact of the book. I'd like to thank sincerely the committee members for their service, their really great service uh, in this process. Thank you very much. Selecting a winner was difficult and ultimately we failed. That is, we failed to choose a single winner, and my, my punchline was sort of stolen as a moment ago, but we did succeed, of course, in identifying two equally ranked, outstanding books. One of these books is titled Growing Up in the Ice Age, Fossil and Archaeological Evidence of the Lived Lives of Pleistocene children. It's authored by April Noel and it's published by Oxbow Books. I must say, children are certainly taking centre stage tonight and wonderfully. Um, so here is our uh, commendation of this book. Everyone should be able to relate to and learn from this fascinating book about Paleolithic children and childhood. It represents an admirable effort to combine well-defined theories and hypotheses with an interdisciplinary array of scientific information, including a surprisingly wide range of archaeological data, to make a novel contribution to this still underexplored aspect of Paleolithic societies. A socially inclusive emphasis on dynamic and diverse childhoods in which children are seen to have been active social and economic agents is successfully combined with a wider evolutionary perspective, showing how children and socialization affected the longer trajectory of the human species. So perhaps I'll present, uh, I wasn't quite clear if uh, of our prize winners were given the stage, but at this point, I'll, I'll award this prize first before I introduce the second book. So April, would you like to step up? Congratulations, April. Well, thank you so much uh, to the EAA and to the selection committee. I have to say that um, this was the best email to wake up to in Canada. <laughs> Uh, I was just uh, overwhelmed, so it was such an honor. Uh, and tonight, um, one of the common themes that we've been hearing is the importance of collaboration, exchange of ideas, mutual support. Uh, and in that light, I just wanted to very briefly thank um, a few of my friends and colleagues who are in this room tonight, uh, Jane Baxter, Tracy Ardren, and um, Eileen Murphy, but this time as a researcher. <laughs> Um, just in terms of the kinds of pioneering work that these women uh, have done in the with the archaeology of childhood, showing us really that children aren't invisible, that it is possible to know the, their lives in in multi dimensions, and then to see this uh, continuing with the with the student prize <laughs> that is being carried on to the next generation is so exciting. Um, so I wanted to invite all of you to the session on childhood that will be happening on Saturday in honor of Greta Lillenhammer, who is the first person to call for an archaeology of childhood. She can't be with us, but um, we will be there celebrating uh, her work. And uh, just the final thing that I wanted to say was that I wrote this book uh, during COVID, during the year of 2020, when everything shut down and I couldn't travel anymore and I couldn't avoid <laughs> the emails from my editor. <laughs> And um, and I sat there when I was sitting there on my bed typing because I that's you know I just haven't changed since I was a student that's where I sit and work um, 
I just, the idea that we would all come together, there would be a time when we could all be together again and celebrating uh, was just completely unimaginable. So, um, so this is so special to me for that reason and a deep honor. So thank you so very much. Brilliant. The other book, the other outstanding book is titled The Routledge Handbook of Archaeothanatology. Practice that if you, uh, after a few drinks. Bioarchaeology of Mortuary Behavior. And it's edited by Christopher Knussel and Eileen Schotzmans. And it's published by Routledge. So here's our commendation for this book. This comprehensive guide to archaeothanatology or the bioarchaeology of mortuary behavior should have significant global impact on students and professionals working in and around this important interdisciplinary field. Written by experts, the 34 chapters cover a wealth of themes, fascinating case studies, and innovative methodologies. The volume, whose editors benefited from both French and European Union funding, and whose contents connect Francophone and Anglophone approaches to the archaeology of death, is also of positive European significance. This is underlined by the distinctive lexicon of terms used in archaeothanatology, which will facilitate future research integration internationally. So we have Chris to come and accept the prize. Chris, here you go. Well, I'd just like to say that I'm representing my co-editor as well. Aileen is actually doing archaeothanatology in a forensic environment. So she can't be here, but she sends her wishes. And she and I are both very enthusiastic about this and very thankful for the selection by the committee. Um, I'd just like to say that it's quite interesting because what I've seen about weaving essentially is what this book was trying to do. It's a confluence of archaeology and biological anthropology, uh, looking at the human body, how it preserves, how it decomposes, and how it actually influences our interpretations of the past. I think it's a key resource, and we think that the book hopefully portrays this to everyone who would be interested in such a, an effort. And so I just, again, I'm going to keep this relatively short, but just to say that this is, as Robin very clearly and cleverly noted in his uh, little description, it is a, a joining of Anglophone and Francophone researchers. That is not easy um, because they simply have developed independently. It's changing now in the EAA, and I'm really pleased to see that. I have a number of colleagues, French colleagues that are here um, at these meetings, and this is something really important. The other thing it does is it unifies, as I said, biological anthropology and archaeology and also forensic work. That's where archaeothanatology is going. Um, in other words, it's not necessarily just for the past, but also for the present. And uh, how does it do this? Well, it's basically ground truthing. It's testing things that people thought were possible to explain the patterning that they were seeing in the mortuary record. And I think that's a really, it has a lot of implications for a whole variety of, of practitioners and professionals. And um, I think it's something that will have an effect far beyond um, what we in originally anticipated. Um, and that that's the, I think, the, the key aspect of this. It's a platform by which to begin to develop a deeper conversation leading to what I would hope to be a better comprehension of humans, their artifacts, their contexts in the past, and bring it into a, a sort of reality for, for modern people. And I'd just like to say again, I'm very honored, very happy. Yeah, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy and so is Aileen to, to get this award. So thank you very much. Well, every day is a school day. Archaeothanatology. Um, we'll go down that internet rabbit hole later. Um, and the fact, Rob and I apologize, um, the fact that I stole your shows how beautifully unrehearsed and natural this whole ceremony is. Um, my genuine apologies, though, on that. I had not realized. 
end of the awards, but not the end of the end of acknowledgement. And I'd just like to invite briefly EAA president again, Esther Bamfi, back to the stage to do some unfinished business from last year regarding honorary membership. Esther. Yes, you said it quite right. This honorary membership has a story behind. Many of you might remember the fact that Erzsi Yerem, one of our earlier vice presidents, uh, a board member and member of many uh, committees, and uh, last but not least, a long-term uh, supporter of the, of, uh, the uh, Student Award, uh, for EAA, uh, was awarded the honorary membership in 2022 at the Budapest annual meeting. Uh, we were very pleased to see uh, how happy she was to get uh, this uh, honor in her hometown uh, at an annual meeting. Uh, she was hoping for many, many years to happen. And uh, the, as it happens, she was diagnosed with COVID-19 infection just one day before the opening. So uh, I will not repeat now the laudatio uh, I said last year, and she was given uh, the opportunity of uh, saying a few words in her weak voice uh, online from her bed lying with high temperature there. So putting all together, uh, we felt that it is just right uh, to invite her on stage this year uh, because she deserves to get her certificate of her honorary membership in front of all of you. And you should also be given the opportunity to give her a big applause for her work. Thank you, Esther. And before, thanks all of you because I had the privilege to follow EA's growing over the last decades. And I still do hope that I will be able to serve EA in one or in the other way in the next future as well. So thanks again. Thanks for the organizers. And thanks for everybody who is coming and working for the organization. Thank you. Thank you.